I see this more as a brief um, just collection of buzzwords maybe for the discussion that we will have after my talk and Nama's talk. My topic is, is very brief, it's AI and retina. And I've picked three different examples, three different retinal diseases that affect patients across different age groups. On the very left-hand side, you see a picture from an infant with retinopathy of prematurity. So this is from an eye of an infant that is born prematurely. And at the time this image was taken, the infant should, in theory, still be in his or her mother's womb and not um, out on a, a NICU ward. The second picture here in the middle is from a patient, an adult patient with diabetic retinopathy. And on the right hand side, we are at the other end of our age spectrum in a patient who has age related macular degeneration. And for all three diseases that I picked here, I will go into um, each uh, in one um, example each to see how AI can help diagnosing and maybe even improving treatment for these conditions. So the first would be retinopathy of prematurity. These are the different stages for retinopathy of prematurity. Um, left on the top row is stage one, then stage two, stage three, and there's stage four and five at the bottom. And we don't want to see those two. We want to pick up a patient roughly when they hit stage three. And you can see there's a lot of vascular changes. And this vascular change is what we try to pick up both when we do fundoscop fundoscopic exams in these patients, but also when we use, use AI, AI, AI algorithms. So how can we recognize plus disease, this change in the vessel patterns? Initially, this was done by using a standard photograph. This was taken from the iCROP publication back in 1984. They defined a standard photograph of what plus disease is, this change in the vascular pattern at the posterior part of the eye. Now you can all imagine different doctors looking at a patient and then comparing what they see mentally to this standard photograph that they have in their memory or have in front of them um, on a printed paper or on a computer screen, and then start discussing whether this patient now does have or does not have enough plus disease to trigger a treatment. This is not what we see as an ideal situation today, because obviously um, there's a lot of subjective uh, subjectivity going into defining what a plus disease is and what is not. So in the last iteration of the ICROP um, definition of plus disease, we moved away from using a single standard photograph and defined plus disease, this vessel change at the posterior part of the eye, more as a spectrum from normal uh, uh, on the left-hand part of the panel to really severe disease on the right-hand part. And if you take these images um, and tease out the really important patterns, this is just taking the vessels and looking at the tortuosity and the dilatation of these vessels. And clearly just from looking at the uh, bottom part of that screen now, you can see this is something that should be very good for a computer to analyze, maybe better than for a human brain. Um, and this is what we try to do. And uh, in order to do this, you need to have um, a multitude of images. You can't do this on a single sample photograph. You have to take images from many patients. And fortunately, we do have um, clinical images from clinical trials now from infants with ROP. We have those at baseline. This is the top row here and uh, at end of study. And maybe more importantly, we have them from in between. This is an example from a patient who goes from baseline after treatment to a very good disease stage four weeks later, but then um, experiences a reactivation of disease only six weeks after this image here was taken. We see again this vessel change here, tortuosity, dilatation of the vessels, and in the periphery changes of the ROP as well. This needs to be retreated at this stage. And it was done, it was retreated, and the disease went away. But it is very important during such trials and also in clinical reality to pick up when such an ROP reactivation occurs and treat it in time. So the question here was, can we use AI-based algorithms to detect ROP reactivation by looking at the posterior pole vessels? 
And in order to do so, we uh, joined forces with a team from Pete Campbell, who already has developed a very good algorithm looking at ROP images and the vascular severity in primary ROP screening mainly. And we applied his method to our um, CAROP imaging set, so an imaging set coming from a clinical trial. And very interestingly, we can use his vascular severity score to describe how after baseline, after treatment, ROP severity goes down at week one and week four, and then identify those eight eyes in our study that actually had a reactivation of the disease disease that did require retreatment. So this very nicely showed that AI-based algorithms are very good at picking up such vascular changes and showing us when there's a need for retreatment. Moving from infants to adult patients to diabetic retinopathy. In diabetic retinopathy, we're a bit further or maybe much further than we are in ROP because there are devices that are already present in our clinic. We're here in Greifswald based very close to the Baltic Sea and only half an hour away is another hospital in Karlsburg where we do um, the ophthalmological screening for diabetic patients. Now, um, we try to improve our ophthalmological service there by including AI-based algorithm that's, are, that's already on the market. What we do now is we take retinal photographs in the hospital in Karlsburg without an ophthalmologist being there. The AI analysis is automatically done on these images, again, without an ophthalmologist being at that hospital. The ophthalmologist comes once a week, always on a Wednesday, and then reviews all data and can review all patients. What we try to do with our AI, AI algorithm here is we try to improve the efficiency of our ophthalmological office hours. We don't necessarily have to see each individual patient, only the ones at risk. We can prioritize critical patients. We can give access to screening for patients who otherwise would have missed their ophthalmological appointments. And we can also use it as a telemedicine tool, especially in times when, for example, due to COVID, we can't go to that hospital. The challenges are, however, we try to get good images without pupil dilation. Ideally, you don't want to apply eye drops in a setting where there's no ophthalmologist uh, around. And when the images are taken, there's no ophthalmologist at that hospital. So we do it without pupil dilation. And that is um, a significant downside of the method. In around a third of patients, we don't get good quality images. So this has nothing to do with the AI algorithm. This is just the mere difficulty of getting good images for the AI algorithm to work with. And this is maybe something we can discuss later on. If we do get images, there are some false positive results. And we saw this is particularly the case with younger patients. This is an example from, an, from a juvenile uh, fundus from a patient who is maybe 10, 14 years old. And uh, the AI, AI algorithm diagnosed this patient as having moderate diabetic retinopathy. And all ophthalmologists in the audience now will say, well, this is not diabetic retinopathy. This is just a juvenile eye. This is a normal eye of a young patient. And this is probably due to the fact that the training data set contained maybe not enough of these younger patients. So there might be some errors here when it comes to diagnosing diabetic, diabetic retinopathy in younger patients. This is just one example um, where you have to make sure you really review the data you get from these AI-based systems. So very briefly, the results this can all be uh, read now in our publication. It was um, just uh, published online this week. Uh, we compared the IDXDR diagnosis, that's the AI-based algorithm, to our physician diagnosis. So the gold standard, what does the physician say when he looks the patient into the eye? And you see there's full agreement in around 40% of cases. The fact that IDX, the AI algorithm here, underestimates DR only in very few cases is, in my view, a very good thing. Um, if it errs, it errs on the side of caution. It overestimates diabetic retinopathy compared to our uh, physician, which is obviously a good thing for a screening device. 
If you look at um, images where you do get sufficient quality and the AI, AI algorithm can work, the negative predictive value for severe diabetic retinopathy is a very good 99.6%. There's only one patient up here where the algorithm did not correctly say this is uh, not a, a severe retinopathy of prematurity. Uh, sorry, diabetic retinopathy. This, on, this one patient is uh, the 0.4% missing to 100 here. Otherwise, the algorithm either identified severe di diabetic retinopathy correctly or overestimates the severity. Moving from diabetic retinopathy to age-related macular degeneration, my last example for today. AMD today. A patient comes into our clinic um, and says, I don't see very well anymore. We do an OCT and we find you have age-related macular degeneration. Now, this is not what our patient wants to hear. What our patient wants to know is how well will I see? And if you treat me, how many injections will I need? And then we can explain to the patient, well, on average, you probably need around eight injections in the first year, and you have a very good chance that your vision stays stable or maybe even improves. But that's also not what the patient wants to know, because that graph here on the left-hand side shows you there are patients who need one or two or three injections and some who need 12 injections. And there's no way for us to tell that patient whether she will be here or here. So the cohort data we use today in our everyday clinic to predict something about the future of an, of an individual patient has nothing to do with an individual prediction for that particular patient. And here's the question, can, I, can AI help us to be better? What we do now is we can diagnose A and D and we can put a label on it. And um, artificial intelligence has been shown to be quite capable of doing the exact same thing. This was an article published in 2018 showing that AI algorithm can also put a label to the disease and say, this is AMD. The interesting question is, can it do more? Can it give us a prognosis for an individual patient? This is something we looked, um, we tried to investigate in an ongoing um, um, analysis. We took OCT images for many patients. In, in this example, it's over 3 million individual images from over 3,000 patients. And then we tried to analyze whether we can predict visual acuity with AI, AI algorithms from these images. And the first question is, can we give a diagnosis? And as I said earlier, this works quite well. We, could, we can put a label to the disease if it's normal, um, our algorithm, in most cases, also agrees with the human diagnosis that is, is normal. It can identify DMEs, uh, diabetic macular edema, and AMD. The more, much more challenging question, however, is can it also predict visual acuity for patients? And here you see the diagonal line again. A lot of these patients actually end up on this diagonal line, meaning the prediction corresponded well with the real visual acuity. But there are far too many numbers down here and up here. So there are many eyes where the algorithm was off track and didn't find the right estimate for visual acuity prediction. And this is a work in progress. And I put this here just to show you that it's much more difficult for AI-based algorithms to predict the future, just as it is for us humans uh, in our everyday clinic. But this is something where I personally see a big advantage of AI algorithms if they get into the clinics and help us doing something what currently we're only partly able to do. So to summarize AI and retina, we looked at three different conditions. In ROP, we asked, can AI help us to predict ROP reactivation? In diabetic retinopathy, we asked, how do we incorporate AI algorithms that are already there in our clinical routine? And in AMD, we asked, can AI assist in individual disease prediction? And maybe just uh, for our discussion later, I highlighted three words here that I find personally very important. I see AI algorithms as a tool. They can help, they can assist, 
and they need to be incorporated into our toolbox that currently exists already of many different tools. Fundoscopy is one tool, OCT is another tool, and in my view, um, AI-based algorithms can just as well be the next tool in our toolbox. Thank you.